Hey, I'm Alex Rockwell. So the other day I posted a video of myself playing a short little guitar piece titled Waltz for Guitar by Frank Zappa, and I got some mixed reactions. I should have seen it coming, to be honest, because it's 12-tone music. I always forget 12-tone music is controversial. Like here are some comments I got. You look very skilled, but sound like you can't tune a guitar. Why would you upload this? Keep practicing and in month post something. Come on, bro. And to think that I thought you actually had a sense of good music and trash. And these are really funny to me because it's obvious that they're coming from a place of misunderstanding. I don't mean that in a way that's like, haha, this is way over their heads, I'm so smart, they're so dumb. Making fun of someone for not knowing something is stupid and not funny. What I mean is that this type of music has a quality that always elicits this visceral reaction from people who don't understand it that is so extreme, it turns into an attack on the person playing it. But for all those people reacting negatively, there are people who will jump to the defense of the performer saying, actually, this is how it's supposed to sound. Please look up blah, 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 and come back. Most 12-tone music is really dissonant. It's just how it is. It's not designed to be beautiful. It uses compositional methods that are far removed from the tonal music most of us humans regularly listen to. And it takes a trained and educated ear to understand and appreciate this music. Therein lies the controversy. It's not pretty, and it's not accessible to the average listener, and therefore, it's self-indulgent garbage. So, we're going to talk about this Zappa waltz and the forgotten musical tradition that it comes from. Hopefully, if you heard me play it and immediately thought, this sucks, you can at least walk away with some more context and understand where it comes from. Maybe you'll be inspired by the techniques involved in composing this music. Who knows? This is the sheet music for it. I found it in my bookcase not too long ago, and I forgot I had it. I got this from Stanley Yates, my last teacher. Uh, I was over at his house one time, and he was showing me stuff in his gigantic collection of printed guitar music. We found this, and he just gave it to me. I don't even remember why. And since I rediscovered it recently, I figured I'd take a crack at learning it. I think it's kind of fun to play. I did a little research on it and learned that it was first published in 1992 in a guitar player magazine special titled... Zappa. He composed it on December 22nd, 1958, the day after he turned 18. This is what he had to say on it in the magazine. This is a 12-tone crab cannon written when I was 18. There's actually another version for two guitars, so it's a double crab cannon. I don't know where it is, though. I'd been doing 12-tone music for quite some time before I did this, but it was the first time I'd tried to write something for the guitar. I couldn't play it, and I never got to hear it until I got the synclavier. And because it's printed on the synclavier, that also means I got to push the button and listen to it. It's kind of short and boring. 12-tone music goes by a handful of names. It's also called dodecaphonic music, serial music, serialism, or some mishmash of those names. This technique was invented by the Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg. He began working to develop the technique after World War I, and once he had it worked out, he began composing his first 12-tone pieces in 1920 and his students Alban Berg and Anton Webern would go on to utilize the technique in their music as well. His goal was to develop a system of composing atonal music, or music that has no key center. This was all happening at the tail end of the Romantic period in music history, and composers were generally getting exhausted with big, giant, epic operas and symphonies, a la Richard Wagner and Gustav Mahler. Schoenberg came to the conclusion that in order to do this, you need all 12 chromatic pitches represented and they all need to carry equal weight in the music. And the 12-tone technique that he developed achieves this. Here's how it works. You take all 12 chromatic pitches and you arrange them in some order of your choosing. Your choices will usually be based in large part on the intervallic relationships between each pair of pitches. Sharp or flat spelling doesn't matter. What you now have is called a tone row. This is going to be the tool you use to compose the music. In the music, the notes must appear in the order you established. They can happen in any octave, you can also have two adjacent notes in the row sound at the same time, forming a chord of sorts. You can also trill back and forth between two adjacent notes, but in general, you can't break the order. You have to make it through the entire row and then start over. As soon as you break the order of the row, you're giving more weight to one note than others, and now you're hinting at a key center. This method might seem very restrictive, almost like a computer program generating music. You still get to choose what octave each note occurs in. You also get to choose the rhythms and the meter, the articulations, the dynamics. You can also expand your original prime tone row into what's called a tone matrix, which is 
a whole bunch of other tone rows that are derived from your original one. The top row going right to left is the retrograde row, which is the prime row in reverse order. The row going down the left side is the inversion row, which you get by inverting all the intervals in the prime row. It's like flipping it upside down. And then going up the left side gives you the retrograde inversion row, which is just the inversion row in reverse. All these other rows going across the matrix in different directions are transpositions of all of those. When you're calculating your tone matrix, you know you did it right if your starting pitch from the prime row goes diagonally across to the bottom right corner. The math just always makes it work out that way. The idea is that you can pick and choose other tone rows from this matrix to use in your composition, because they're all mathematically related. It's a similar idea to there being a relative minor key to every major key. Sort of. Now, what does music written with this system sound like? Well, most people think it sounds like shit. it was never meant to appeal to the general public. There's a relatively small number of people out there who are hip to this stuff. Being able to do this at all was basically born out of the trend of increasingly dissonant and complex dominant chords over the 19th century. Schoenberg called this the emancipation of dissonance. As the ear becomes acclimatized to a sonority within a particular context, the sonority will gradually become emancipated from that context and seek a new one. The emancipation of the dominant quality dissonances has followed this pattern, with the dominant seventh developing in status from a contrapuntal note in the 16th century to a quasi-consonant harmonic note in the early 19th. By the later 19th century, the higher numbered dominant quality dissonances had also achieved harmonic status, with resolution delayed or omitted completely. The greater autonomy of the dominant quality dissonance contributed significantly to the weakening of traditional tonal function within a purely diatonic context. A fear of dissonance in music sort of melted away among musicians, and for many the emancipation of dissonance was likened to the emancipation of humanity. Duke Ellington once said, that's the Negro's life, hear that chord. Dissonance is our way of life in America. We are something apart, yet an integral part. All humans are equal, just as all pitches are equal. And after World War II, there was like a paradigm shift where suddenly, if you planned on calling yourself a serious composer, you had to be composing with this technique. Out of nowhere, composers you would never expect to adopt this system in their music were all using it. experiencing a lot of post-war existential dread, and there was growing anxiety over thermonuclear annihilation. So the art and music reflected that in a lot of ways. Art has historically reflected the socio-political landscape in which it was conceived. In more recent years, 12-tone music has fallen out of fashion. Now it's generally considered just another compositional technique to achieve a certain flavor of sound. That's 12-tone music in a nutshell. Zappa composed this guitar waltz in 1958, which was around the height of the 12-tone technique's popularity. It's actually very clever, the way it works. There's two different tone rows that he implies simultaneously that aren't related to each other. Each independent voice is using 
one tone row, and they start at different points in the row, which is probably why he describes it as a canon. considered together, they form another tone row with no repeated notes. Really clever. If I was still in my grad school music analysis class, I could probably write a 30-page paper breaking this down. Yeah. Sexy stuff. What else did Zappa say on it? I'd been doing 12-tone music for quite some time before I did this, but it was the first time I tried to write something for the guitar. I couldn't play it, and I never got to hear it until I got the synclavier. Okay, that's cool. Zappa was a bit of a latecomer to the guitar. He got his first instrument in 1957, only a year before he wrote this, so he would have been 16 or 17. But apparently this is the first thing Zappa ever wrote for the guitar, and at the time he wasn't even good enough to play it. That's amazing. I mean, what an awesome little piece of history. This is all there is of it too. It never made it onto a Mothers of Invention album or any of Zappa's later solo stuff. I wonder why. It's kind of short and boring. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Well, I just wanted to share this and nerd out about it a little. I'm sure Zappa fans will dig this, plus you got a primer on 12-tone music. People don't realize Frank Zappa was just as accomplished an avant-garde composer as any of the textbook names of the 20th century. Milton Babbitt, Pierre Boulez, George Crumb, Georges Ligeti, etc. Except instead of writing for classical ensembles like all of those people, Zappa's preferred medium was a rock band. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support the creation of future videos like this, the best way to do that is to purchase an exercise book from my store. I have several available in print and PDF that focus on different fundamental aspects of playing music. I also offer private Zoom lessons to people around the world, so if you want to know about my availability, feel free to reach out directly. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.